In this lecture, we're going to learn about diatomic elements and monoatomic elements. We have learned at this point that an element is a group of the same type of atoms. If we were to draw a model, we would draw structures or symbols that represent a group of the same type of atoms. So in this case, I have blue circles that represent individual atoms, and they look the same, so therefore a group of them is an element. Now the way that I've drawn them is that they're individual atoms. So this is monoatomic. Okay, that's the way we're drawing it. That means one. Mono is one. So there's individually, there's the atoms hanging out by themselves. Now we have a group of elements who love to hang out by themselves and they're right here. This last column, column 18, is called the noble gases. So let's write that. The noble gases. And the noble gases are given this name because Sir William Ramsey was a knight or was knighted by the king of or queen of England, I believe, and he discovered these elements, or at least most of them, not all of them. In any case, this group is monoatomic. Now, I should not do the radon, but I should stay with here. These guys right here are all monoatomic. They don't like to bond with other elements. In fact, they stay monoatomic. That's why helium is not reactive. So all of these elements here, helium, neon, argon, krypton, and xenon, are sometimes called the inert gases. Inert means they resist reactivity. And these elements do not react. And we're going to learn why down the road, but right now, they hang out by themselves. So, these, so this could be an atom of helium. And all of these could be helium. And they never tend to bond with anything, so they hang out by themselves. So we call them monoatomic. Now, we also have something called diatomic, okay? So diatomic, if you've ever ridden a dicycle, it's two things. So diatomic means atoms like to bond with themselves in pairs. So diatomic would mean an element like hydrogen, which is diatomic, by the way, loves to become H2. Oxygen. Okay, likes to become O2, and you know that from your biology class or living environment class. Okay, so elements that love to bond with themselves, and they do so, and we're going to learn why, because they make a very, very stable low energy arrangement. Think about yourself. At the end of the day, what do you want to do? Hang out, put your feet up, rest, kick back, relax. Well, atoms bond with themselves because they can use each other to achieve a low energy state. These guys over here are already a low energy state. And we'll get to those specifics later. But there are a bunch of elements that love to bond with themselves. So let's write them. All right. So we're going to have, we have hydrogen. We have um, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine. All of these love to bond with themselves. So we have hydrogen, we have oxygen, fluorine, okay, bromine, chlorine, nitrogen, and iodine. Okay, and the reason that I'm telling you this is you have to be aware for a couple of different reasons down the road and in, in this unit who your diatomic elements are. These guys love to bond with themselves. They love to become O2, F2, Br2, I2, N2, and Cl2. And there's reasons why they do that, and it's reasons that I can't get into right now while you have to know. But the reason I'm bringing it up now is in your particle diagrams. Okay, let's just wipe this important information out. In your particle definitions or diagrams, if you were to write and ask to be writing a diatomic element, Okay, so let's say hydrogen or oxygen or fluorine or any one of these things that I love to call, by the way, Hofbrinkles. Nice mnemonic to remember these guys is called Hofbrinkles. So yeah, Hofbrinkles are a way to remember. Some people call them Brinklehops. I like to use Hofbrinkles. Okay, so Hofbrinkles are the elements that are diatomic, and that's a nice mnemonic 
to, to remember those elements that love to bond with themselves. But back to our particle diagrams. If we were asked to draw a particle diagram of hydrogen, we would write, well here, if this is hydrogen, we would have two of them bonded. And probably a better way to do that would have two circles so we can see it. So this would be hydrogen. And you say, whoa, these things are bonding. These things are compounds. What's the definition of a compound? A group of the same type of molecules. And what's a molecule? Two or more different atoms. This is still an element. In fact, it's a diatomic element. Why is it an element? Use your rules. Use your vocabulary. Group of the same type of elements, whether they're bonded to themselves or not. It's still a group of the same type of what? Atoms. The individual atoms are all still what? They're all still hydrogen. We'll make the hydrogen come over here. Okay? So, this are individual atoms, and there's a group of the same type of atoms, so they're still elements, but they're now we call them diatomic elements. So, you could have, okay, elements that bond to themselves. This could be oxygen. And it's an element because it's still a group of the same type of atoms, whether they bond to themselves or not. Remember, a compound is two or more different. But whether they bond to themselves or not, it doesn't change the fact. So if you ever see two of the same atoms bonding together, it's a diatomic element. And elements that hang out by themselves are monoatomic. Okay, And that's something to think about in your particle diagrams. But we have to know who our Hofbrinkles are, who our diatomic elements are, and we should be aware of those elements that can only stay by themselves, which we call di monoatomic. Let's also not forget that when we draw these particle diagrams, they are different atoms. So if this is, let's say, neon, one of the monoatomic noble gases, what we mean is the reason why we draw them the same is because, well, if it's neon, if we erase this a little bit, we can see that only neon has 10 protons. Remember, what makes an atom unique is the number of protons. We can't see it, so we use models. Don't forget, we're doing three things. We're going from a definition, using a model to understand what really happens. Okay, so it's understanding that the models bridge the definition to what has really happened in reality. Boron, don't be one, has five. Carbon has six. Every unique element we write with these symbolic models to show that they are different, not by how blue they are or how big they are, okay, as we did in our homework. We write that they're different by their proton number, and every single element has a unique number of protons. It's the biggest number called the atomic number, all right? No other element has 10 protons except for neon. And that's what gives them the differences. But we can't see those things, so we use these models. Don't lose sight what the models are trying to do for us, which are basically give us an understanding of reality. Are they truly reality? No, but they really can help us gain some insight because we can't see protons in an atom. Okay?